Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of X-Men 97, episode three, Fire Made Flesh. I am gonna break down this episode frame by frame for the animation details and the Marvel Easter eggs you missed and the fascinating big swings this episode is taking with Marvel lore as we know it. The best way to support New Rockstars right now and to celebrate the return of the X-Men is to grab one of these Xavier Institute shirts at nerdriot.shop. The opening titles of this episode are similar to what they were in episode two with Magneto now leading the lineup, but some new shots have been added. Added. First, we see Magneto trapping Wolverine, Storm, and Cyclops in an electromagnetic bubble. This from Season 1, Episode 3, Enter Magneto, when Magneto says, Better that we die on our feet than live on our knees. Then, after the shot of the Phoenix-empowered Jean Grey, we see a new shot of Roberta DaCosta fleeing members of the FOH and running into this fence. This was the iconic shot of Jubilee in the 90s run opening, and I pointed out last week that they removed it, but now it's Sunspot as a newcomer in the role of Jubilee in this 2024 season. There's a new shot of Lalandra the Shi'ar pounding the control panel with Charles behind her and her advisor, Akari. This is from Season 3, Episode 17, Dark Phoenix Part 4, Fate of the Phoenix. They've actually redrawn these scenes slightly to make them more cinematic and fit everything into the new aspect ratio. This is right before Jean as the Phoenix brings the Shi'ar weapons online to destroy herself. So a reminder though that Charles left with Alondra to recover from his coma in the 90s run finale, Graduation Day. And despite this new series suggesting he's dead, it seems like it is just a cover story, but there also might be something else going on. Then the shot of Scott covering himself from Phoenix Jean firing up in that same Season 3, Episode 17, Dark Phoenix episode. Jean sacrifices herself in this moment by turning the Shi'ar weapons to kill her, and she pushes Scott out of the way and tells him, part of me will always be with you. Similar to the message that she or Madeline Pryor, or maybe she in the moment was Madeline Pryor, either way that the mother gives to baby Nathan at the end of this episode. In general, this updated intro just really wants to remind us of Scott's entire history with Jean as it was depicted in the 90s series, and it reframes the way we should look at that character throughout that run. But also, we get this shot of Remy Laveau shirtless holding Rogue during a basketball game as she kisses the back of her hand. They declare their love in the season two finale episodes, but episode two of this season ended with Gambit feeling spurned when Rogue and Magneto managed to make skin contact, which is something that a subplot in this episode addresses. Okay, so this episode opens with Beast looking over the Jean Grey doppelganger who showed up at the end of episode two. I didn't mention this before because I didn't want to spoil too much of what happens in this episode, but watchers of the 90s run will know that perhaps the truest thing about Jean Grey is that after she would use her powers, she would always sigh and think as evidenced by this Screen Junkies montage. Uh, 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 uh. While the gene we've been with delivered a baby and did not faint at all, the first thing this one who shows up at the door did was faint into Morph's arms. Though, then again, that Jean Grey that we watched throughout the 90s X-Men series might, according to this episode, have been Madeline Pryor. They kind of leave it a mystery, and it's gonna be one that we talk about forever and ever. But according to this episode, the first Jean that we started this season with was Madeline Pryor. So from here forward, we're gonna call her Madeline. Madeline scans Jean's mind, and we see various stills from Jean throughout the 90s run, but her face is now blank. In these images, you'll notice all flip back to the left counterclockwise, kind of like a carousel projector slideshow going back through the memories. We see Jean from season one, episode five, Captive Hearts, when she trains with the others in the danger room and says, you're tangling with the wrong X-Men, but this one's face is blank. You'll notice that they slightly altered the animation design for some of these, which makes them hard to locate, but they did like take some of the stills and just change little details. Then we see Jean in her original Marvel Girl costume from the Dark Phoenix saga, Cyclops' arm around her. This is from season three, episode 17, The Dark Phoenix, part four, Fate of the Phoenix. When Jean wore that costume, Lelandra had just explained that the X-Men will battle the Shi'ar Imperial guard in this moment. Then we see Cyclops holding a fainted Jean from season one, episode eight, Unstoppable Juggernaut. And then a shot of Scott kissing Jean on the floor as Wolverine's pissed off in the foreground. Again, this is from season one, episode five, Captive Hearts. This is right after the X-Men fought the Morlocks and Jean tells Scott that she had no idea he had such beautiful eyes. Then Dark Phoenix Jean from season three, episode 16, Dark Phoenix part three. This is right after the Dark Phoenix was fully taken over by Jean and she gave her the I am fire made flesh speech after freeing herself from the inner circle's control. And this was the origin of the phrase Fire Made Flesh that is this episode's title. And then Jean in her bed holding Scott's hand. And this is hilarious because it's either from season three, episode four, Phoenix Saga part three, Cry of the Banshee, or season three, episode 14, Dark Phoenix part one, Dazzled. And it is literally the same shot, but they reuse the animation episode to episode. And then we see Jean and Scott on their wedding day from season two, episode one, from Till Death to Us part, part one. This is Scott and Jean's first wedding.
wedding when they think they're being married, but the priest marrying them is actually Morph in disguise. And that in this episode is why Morph is so guilty. And I just love this visual concept of having the real Jean Grey only just having a presentational snapshot of those areas of her life and her face to just be like an undeveloped part or an underexposed part of the film as it was being developed. Like she just has an observer's point of view as another woman, a clone of her, was living her life. Jean wasn't living them herself, so she can only imagine just a blank face in place of her face. But these memories transition into Madeline seeing Jean or herself waking up in this green tinted laboratory escaping and then peeking out from an alley to see a crazy Eddie's electronic shop. And last week's breakdown, I talked about how that chain was around in the 80s and then closed down to, to fraud and bankruptcy. But I love how there's a sign for VCRs and DVDs because it was 1997. It was just kind of a weird overlap year where you could buy both VCR and DVDs in places like Radio Shack or Circuit City or Best Buy. Now, Morph proposes to call the mystery gene Gene Doe and then morphs into Spiral to raise all six hands for a vote, which is such a great gag. I love how Morph awkwardly sits back down with the hand still raised in the background as the scene refocuses back to Hank. But Spiral is the six-armed stunt woman from Mojo World who appeared in the season two, episode 11, Mojo Vision episode, and then in the season three, episode 10, Long Shot episode that returns to Mojo World. And the next week's episode has Motendo in the title, suggesting a Mojo Nintendo storyline. So presumably we will see Spiral and maybe Long Shot again. Beast says, I used gamma rays to isolate the hemoglobic properties of both genes' genetic markers. Ah, gamma rays, famously the type of radiation used by Bruce Banner to become the Incredible Hulk, also tech used by Hank throughout the 90s run. And in the original pilot episode, when asked what makes mutants the way that they are, Beast responded with a variety of things, gamma rays, pollution, ozone depletion, and television. Beast confirms that Gene Doe is older, AKA the real Gene. And Madeline basing her reality on her own intact memories compared to Gene Doe's fragments of memories, she refuses to accept the truth. Scott, tell them. Ha! Another example of the animators just using a still frame as a reaction shot, like Roberto DeCosto's Frozen, huh? Face in episode one, but here, Scott being stone-faced is the most devastating reaction for Madeline to see. So Madeline snaps at them. I fought by your side in countless battles, given my life how many times? You know me. Yeah, Madeline is really just worked up and making a point about the multitude of times Jean has literally sacrificed herself. But it's just worth noting that, you know, her memories are starting to get a little hazy and she might not be as sure how many times exactly she's experienced that objective reality. But also we should note at this point that this would never be something the real Jean said. Because when the real Jean was told by Bishop in the original series that an X-Men was going to assassinate someone, Jean at the time was the first one who admitted that it could be her. Because she, like everyone else, has the capacity for darkness. So it's kind of like a decision of King Solomon, right? The real Jean, whoever she is, would accept the possibility that she might be the bad guy. But then having a heartbreaking moment with Scott, a voice croaks out over the baby monitor. Jean, Jean Grey. Who's there? Answers. I and any parent can tell you the creepiest thing in your household when you have a newborn is an unexpected noise from a baby monitor. Your sleep deprived body becomes physically rewired to just be triggered by this little machine. Like you went from being a rational parentless adult into a paranoid Jodie Foster in contact listening for whispers from another dimension as your domicile becomes the house from Poltergeist. So hearing Mr. Sinister call to Madeline over the baby monitor freaked me the f out. Thunder claps outside, setting a dramatic and horror-filled atmosphere for this episode, but one wonders if Storm were here and if she still had her powers, the weather would be more favorable because episode two ended with her getting scared by this same thunderstorm. That storm started with Storm not being Storm anymore. Bishop says, Tom Band's looking slick, Beast. Must be ready soon. Future's calling me. And Beast says that as soon as they're done with the gene crisis, they'll be able to make the final modifications and send Bishop back to his time. And you may be rightly wondering what the hell Bishop is doing here at the start of X-Men 97, as he was not with them in the finale of the 90s run, and he was normally set in the year 2055. Based on how this episode ends, I'm sure we'll get an answer for why Bishop went back in time to begin with. Of course, baby Nathan Summers canonically grows up to be Cable when Apocalypse gives him a techno-organic virus that he's taken into the future year of 3999 to cure, but this episode changes it so that since Sinister gives him that virus instead of Apocalypse. Like we know structurally why Bishop needed to be here to take baby Nathan into the future, but why was he there to begin with? Well, clearly this mystery that they're still setting up because Bishop's time travel chatter just gets cut off. Interestingly, when Scott brings up how Bishop from 2055 never knew of a past in 1997, in which Magneto took over the X-Men and he was never aware of any Madeline Pryor drama. But Bishop's explanation is interesting. Time isn't some history book, man. 
It's always riding. Skipping forward, headed into- Oh, my stars and garters. Ah, uh, yes, the comic catchphrase, oh, my stars and garters. But I think Bishop's line suggests that we might be currently experiencing a timeline altered by future time travelers, including Cable, and maybe even Kang the Conqueror, because Immortus appeared in the 90s run as the creator of the Axis of Time in season four's Beyond Good and Evil arc. And notice how Bishop was about to say, headed into something. And before Beast cut him off, I wonder if he was going to say, headed in some divinely laid out path or destiny. And so we could look at all these details from the first three episodes of the season, like Storm losing her powers, Magneto taking over the X-Men and hooking up with Rogue, Sinister giving Nathan the virus instead of Apocalypse, maybe even Charles being dead, as has been suggested, and the language in Aurora's letter to Jean about living alternate lives in alternate worlds. I just wonder if we could be looking at a darkest timeline that is destined to be retconned. Like we're just kind of exploring like a what if scenario in this season of episodes, and then later time travel shenanigans are just gonna fix everything. So Beast recognizes Madeline's DNA as the work of Mr. Sinister, who appears in the lightning flash from the shadows of the nursery. So Mr. Sinister, AKA Nathaniel Essex, is one of the biggest X-Men villains, and he played a major role in season two of the 90s run, creeping on Jean and Scott's engagement and marriage, and repeatedly trying to kidnap Jean to produce a genetically superior strain of mutants from their offspring. But season five, episode nine, Descent details Nathaniel Essex's origins in 1888 as a geneticist in London obsessed with Charles Darwin and a plot involved Involving Professor X's ancestor, James Xavier, and Jean's ancestor, Rebecca Gray, whom Nathaniel Essex experimented on, and it suggested that these experiments might have been part of the origin of Jean Grey's mutation. Sinister shows Madeline the time he had both her and Jean in his lab and uses his red crystal to activate her consciousness, and she smashes her photos of the X-Men and courses with green energy, transforming her look with this black corset. They, they shall know my, my Inferno! Ah, Inferno. This is a nod to the Inferno comic storyline, in which Chris Claremont, partnering with Louis Simonson in 1989, retconned the whole confusion over Jean Grey and Madeline Pryor from the previous years of X-Men and X-Factor comics to establish that the Jean Grey that Cyclops had married and produced baby Nathan with was actually a clone produced by Mr. Sinister with the goal of having Jean and Grey have a baby that he could use in his experiments. And then Madeline Pryor at that point would be corrupted by her anger and her demonic influence to become the Goblin Queen, as she does in this episode. So while the Goblin Queen outfit here is certainly sexy, it is way less overt than the fully insane underboob cut and the thigh-high loincloth of her comic appearance. And I do like the little detail that here, her cape makes it look like she has bat wings. Meanwhile, Wolverine, Gambit, and Morph exit the danger room and Morph checks the schedule to see that Rogue and Magneto are using this room to f non-stop. Friday 8 to 10, Rogue and Magneto. Friday 10 to 12, Rogue and Magneto. And it says 10 p.m. to 12 p.m., which I just assume is an error, but I like to imagine that they might be banging for a marathon 14-hour session. But then Saturday 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., that's correct. 12 p.m. to 2 p.m., 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. And Morph comments, Wow. Rogue's really training her stamina with the new boss. Uh, stamina, the way Morph says it. Now, if you're wondering how Magneto can touch Rogue without his powers being drained, the Age of Apocalypse storyline explores how Eric Lyncher and Marie were married and had a kid after he could create an ultra thin magnetic field around his entire body that allows sensation, but no real contact. So essentially, for his pleasure. But we should note that this schedule screen is green and all the other hallucinations seem to be cast in some green light. So I don't know, maybe Gambit and Morph are seeing all of these schedule bookings as like a reality manipulation. I don't know. I still think Rogue and Magneto are f***ing in real life. Sunspot and Jubilee watch some Friday night show. As if he's obsessed with me. You're racing. Like he's out there. So this show also was clearly manipulated by, you know, the reality warping of the Goblin Queen, but we try to figure out what 1997 show this could be. The over the shoulder shot and the tone doesn't seem like it's like a TGIF sitcom like Boy Meets World or Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Our thinking was maybe The X-Files as it aired on Friday nights on Fox, like the 90s Fox series did, and it shares the X prefix branding. Gambit sees Rogue and Magneto in a Louisiana swamp themed hallucination, really just to rub it in Gambit's face. Their bodies melt into each other, yuck. But this is an extreme version of Rogue's aversion to skin contact, but just really designed to get under Gambit's skin. I'm also reminded of Ron Weasley seeing his fear of Harry and Hermione naked and kissing in Deathly Hallows, a hallucination that was cast by the Horcrux. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Mental health can be a hard thing to wrap your mind around. Everybody has off days, but when those days start becoming more frequent or taking more of a toll, it's time to find a therapist, which is exactly what BetterHelp can help you do. BetterHelp makes starting therapy easier and less intimidating for a lot of people. For 
first, you just go to their website. You can use our link, betterhelp.com slash new rock stars. You answer a few questions and BetterHelp will match you to a professional who has years of experience helping people with struggles just like yours. You can do it all from your phone or computer, via phone call, video chat, or messaging, however you feel the most comfortable. It's the easiest possible way to start talking to a therapist. You'll be matched with therapists usually within 48 hours, so you can get started fast. Let BetterHelp connect you to a therapist who can support you, all from the comfort of your own home. Visit betterhelp.com slash new rock stars or choose new rock stars during sign up and enjoy a special discount on your first month. The TV character crawls out of the TV like the girl in the ring and Jubilee charges up her popcorn pot with fireworks and zips it at its head and you can see the gnarly animation of its brain split open. But then the vision transforms into Roberto's mother, a woman who speaks Portuguese. Meanwhile, Wolverine turns into Mr. Sinister in the showers, his shoulders casting a silhouette of a spider and Morph shouts, not again, referring to season two when Sinister used Morph in a plot to kidnap the X-Men. Scott and Bishop run to the nursery where Bishop's like, this doesn't look good. Yeah, no shit, dude. And then the mobile turns into a tentacle monster and the teddy bear turns into a grotesque form of Charles. With the toys transforming into these demonic forms, it kind of feels like what happens in Poltergeist, right? Baby Nathan in this episode is essentially Carol Ann. Or like the baby from Labyrinth. I just get so worried when babies and kids get taken by dark forces. But then this female face appears to Bishop. You abandoned me, Bishop. Where's your home? When is your time? So this is Shard, Bishop's sister from the season four One Man's Worth storyline that evolved going back in time to stop Professor X's assassination. And after Apocalypse gets defeated, she goes back with Bishop to their own time. So Sinister is taking a form that just reflects whatever inner fear or anxieties inside each of them. But the form of Roberta's mother spews out from her mouth another face. This could actually be Keller, the racist boy who attacks Roberto, causing his solar powers to manifest for the first time. We see Annie Richardson later for Jean, so it just makes sense that it would be Keller for Roberto. The elevator doors open on Beast, revealing his massive yellow green face. I think one of us has the wrong floor. Mm-hmm. That, I don't know, kind of reminds me of Mojo, but I don't think it's Mojo. We're gonna see Mojo next week though. The mansion crumbles and they all tumble down into hell or like the reality warped illusion of hell. I guess, you know, we could argue about whether hell is real or just like a mental state that any reality warper could access. I'm not gonna get into the metaphysics of it. But Beast references Dante's Inferno where Virgil leads Dante through the nine circles of hell where each level punishes a different sin. But he also references Beware the Jabberwock from Lewis Carroll's 1871 Jabberwocky nonsense poem. And that's essentially what we are seeing brought to life, a nonsense poem. I love this part of the episode and I was praying that we would see Mephisto show up, but um, nope, not here. Bishop fastball specials Wolverine into Beast to knock him off one of the Hell Beasts. Cyclops charges up Bishop with his optic blast and Bishop redirects the beams to take out the rest of the Hell Beasts. A demonic sentinel rises from the magma and I think this might be the same one that Madeline saw in her vision from Henry Gyrick's mind in episode one, but real Jean Grey intervenes and lifts them all from Hell. The Goblin Queen reveals herself. Ah! I am the Goblin Queen. And she takes Nathan away. Morph explains Sinister to Roberto, saying he cut up mutants to prolong his own life. He can even take away their will. I should know. And Morph transforms back into their male state with the sunken eyes as they appeared when they were brought back to life in season two of the 90s run as a servant of Sinister. As Morph promises to show Magneto and Scott where Sinister is, we get a bat wipe to Sinister's lair. He takes baby Nathan and plops him into the green fluid. My man, babies cannot swim or hold their breath like that. I don't know, maybe this fluid is like oxygenated or it's like some kind of form of synthetic amniotic fluid that like can revert the baby's lungs back into their prenatal state. (laughs) I don't know. Madeline greets him at the top of the stage I know not what I do. I knew you'd follow Scott. Oh my God, this show. She does the same leg uncrossing that Sharon Stone does in Basic Instinct. If she was wearing the original loincloth outfit, who knows what we would have seen. And yes, with the line, I know not what I do, the Goblin Queen seems to be playing with one of Jesus's final phrases from the cross. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Of course, the Goblin Queen blasphemes. So Morph morphs into Ileana Rasputin, AKA Magic, sister to Colossus, wielding the soul sword. Goblin Queen strikes Morph and turns magic into a demonic form that attacks Bishop, Magneto arrives using the metal window bars in his volley with Madeline, but it gets cut up with shards of stained glass. Meanwhile, Logan works with real Jean to try to get her to remember who she is, calling her Genie like old times. Logan, I mean all that to you. More. It was Logan's love that brought her back. Her first thought though goes to Scott, who's in danger, because sometimes to love someone, we have to love them enough to let them love someone who is not us. Real Jean casts an astral projection of herself to rescue Scott from Madeline and takes her into what I believe is the astral plane, which I'm just assuming because it's where Charles and the Shadow King have fought. Madeline seems to only remember her past as Phoenix, power incarnate, but an even larger form of astral Jean scoops her up in her hand. Power 
Is that all you can remember? A Roman numeral clock reverses and dissolves into the spokes of Charles's wheelchair. Notice not his yellow hover chair, not even his ex-spoked wheelchair from the movies, but an older time when he still had his blanket from the Uncanny X-Men number one era when he first met a young Jean Grey. And notice how she carries his fantasy Cyclops doll, which showed up in the flashback to Jean's childhood in season three, episode 16, Dark Phoenix part three, foreshadowing perhaps her eventual interest in a different Cyclops. Jean and Madeline together look at this past incident, reminding me of the two witches, Wanda Maximoff and Agatha Harkness in episode eight of WandaVision. But here they see the friend who got hit by the car. This is Annie Richardson, whose death in Jean's childhood awakened her telepathic powers in the comics as Jean experienced Annie's emotions as she died. And Madeline snaps. No, it's my pain, not yours. So we learn that the biggest difference between Jean and Madeline is that Jean has been influenced by her full life story, whereas Madeline is rooted only in the most traumatic Phoenix chapters of that story. It's easy for people who've been hurt to just be blind to the pain felt by other people who didn't necessarily wear that pain on their sleeves because those people can compartmentalize the pain and have moved on past it. But for those hurt people to only know how to weaponize that pain against the whole world because they've defined themselves by just the fact that they're victims and they're so blinded by rage to see anything else. Else. And I love how we see this battle play out visually, as only animation seems to be able to do. Madeline showing Jean a series of photographs, memories of the X-Men, including the original Uncanny X-Men number one from 1963, line of portrait from Charles's office, and then later generations of the team, wedding photos. But then Jean swallows Madeline, which is such an interesting visual metaphor. She is the sin eater. She devours the pain. And then we see Madeline going into this aquatic state where Fetus Nathan, with his umbilical cord, enters this same realm and he begins to cry. Now again, babies cannot cry when they are in the womb because their lungs are filled with fluid, but you know, never mind that. It's important to the themes here because that cry, specifically the one that comes when Nathan is born, is synced with Madeline's labor pain. And all chapters of that pain in the subconscious are transformed into love. He's a living reminder of the purest love two people can share and no one can ever, ever take that away from you. And so, Jean helps Madeline transform that pain into undeniable love. So Scott and Madeline work together to find Sinister and they blast a gooey hole in his chest, which is important because normally Sinister can like easily self heal. He's pretty invulnerable to everything except Cyclops' optic blast, which completely freaked him out in season two, episode two, till death to us part, part two. But they free Nathan from the tank and Sinister says, Fools. You have doomed the boy. What does he know? Sinister retreats into the shadows, speaking this nursery rhyme. Ladybird, ladybird, fly away home. So this nursery rhyme was first published in English in 1744, but was probably older than that. It's referring to the insects ladybirds, which were believed to be lucky. But some believe the nursery rhyme was dated back to the 16th century and sung as a warning when there was anti-Catholic legislation moving through England. This is something that Nathaniel Essex would grow up hearing in 19th century London. Obviously, your house is on fire, connects to fire made flesh, and your child is gone, referencing Nathan. But again, we get this idea of an oppressed group, a warning to them that by making these decisions, they are limiting their own numbers in their own kind. So Beast explains that Sinister gave baby Nathan a techno-organic virus in an attempt to make the boy invincible. So Apocalypse is supposed to be the one who gives baby Nathan the techno-organic virus in the comics, but they changed it here to make it Sinister. You notice the patches of the virus on his skin are green? So maybe green is just a reflection of Sinister and it'll fade to blue with age. Bishop offers to take Nathan into the future for a cure. I do know a guy there, smart, can build anything. So in the comics, it is someone else who takes Nathan into the future to eventually become Cable. And it's the year 3999, not the year 2055, as I assume it will be here, but who knows what future year Bishop is going to. But the guy he knows who can make anything is a reference to Forge, or at least the old version of Forge, the tinkerer who just exists alongside Bishop in the future, but we will meet his younger self soon. Scott doesn't want to abandon his son the way he was by his father. He's referring to Corsair, leader of the Star Jammers, who shows up at the end of the season three Dark Phoenix storyline and goes into order end, but then we move on to a scene of the episode that was really, really hard for me to get through. Under the light of the full moon, surrounded by fireflies, Madeline hands off baby Nathan to Bishop, giving him a telepathic goodbye, probably to just stay in this child's mind, buried until the moment he needs it. Reminded me of Meredith Quill giving her son Peter Quill a mixtape that he would only open at a later point in his life. And just the sound design of these final moments really shook me. I can't really go into here on YouTube um, the place this took me to. Just the sound of Nathan's cry being cut off by the rift. I'm now the father to uh, a newborn son. 
And um, like every time I leave the house, there's like he's, he's crying when I have to go on an errand and just the door shuts. Like parents know this when you hear um, your, your kid crying and then just that sound goes off. It just breaks your heart. It's the sound of your heart breaking. Specifically the image in the animation where they got the fog filling up that oxygen mask on a baby as he's struggling to breathe. I can't go into it further. I'm just explaining to you where I'm coming at this episode and it hits differently when you just had a baby son. But also just to get back into the animation design here, I have to hand it to the animators that they made the time portal, this blue glowing triangular shape that is what Nathan exits through. And I guarantee you it's designed to look like that blue rift in the astral womb that he entered for Madeline to see him. So Madeline decides to leave and she and Jean realize that they don't even know when Sinister switched them. And they don't know which of them experienced which memories, which I just thought was an elegant and beautiful way to address the confusion over the retconning of Madeline Pryor and Jean Grey from the 80s run. Madeline leaves and she says that her name is Madeline Pryor. I assume she will come back at some point in the future. So Jean, meanwhile, returns to her and Scott's wrecked bedroom and the two stand apart from each other, almost like they are strangers. They don't even know how much of a life they've had together. And that is heartbreaking. So onto a bar in Texas. That's the Lone Star State flag right there. This bar is called Tequila Mockingbird, which is obviously a pun on the Harper Lee novel To Kill a Mockingbird, which is set in Alabama. But it is one of the best American novels about the themes of racism and prejudice. We see how on the TV the next three days, it's going to be a hot one. 100 degrees, 102 degrees, and 100 degrees. And Aurora drinks a cold beer and a stranger joins her. Name is Forge, Storm. I'd like to help you get back what you've lost. So this would be present day Forge. Notably, he has a mullet. In the 90s era, Forge leads the X Factor in the comics, but this character lives to the year of 2055 and will join Bishop as an older man. This final scene sets up the next episode's Motendo slash Life Death Part 1, where at least the Storm storyline will adapt the Life Death comic issue where a depowered Storm with the Mohawk joins Forge on his Texas compound. So a lot to talk about at the end of this episode. X-Men 97 is leaning hard into time travel, folks. And by saying the word remember, to say goodbye to Nathan, I expect Cable has got to come back in an otherwise Gambit-themed episode titled Remember It coming later this season. And now that Sinister is part of Cable's origin story, does he know the future? There are a lot of rumors that Sinister will be the first big antagonist of the MCU's mutant saga, so I'm curious to see the animated series set him up this way. And also, the biggest question I have, when did Sinister switch Jean with Madeline? I'm going to assume it's at least as far back as season two, maybe with the season two premiere till death to us part, the wedding photo had a blank Jean face, but we also saw images from season one, episode five, Captive Hearts. So was Jean Madeline for the whole series? The whole series? That is why I'm just entertaining the idea for now that this X-Men 97 season could represent an alternate timeline. Comment down below with your thoughts. Huge thanks to Gina Ippolito and Brandon Barrick for their help researching this breakdown. You can follow me at EA Boss. Subscribe to all three channels in the New Rockstars Network for breakdowns and news coverage of everything you love. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.